Good morning, everyone. It is, um, it's a real pleasure to see you all this morning, and uh, what, a, what a wonderful celebration. Now, I will say that um, there is no singing. Um, we had a ribbon cutting for the Metro, the Metro, the Green Line expansion, and there was singing there, but I have to say that although there's no singing here this morning, we are over-the-top excited um, about the launch of Community Behavioral Health Centers. Um, throughout the Commonwealth, and so we're delighted that you're here. It speaks volumes to the um, investment that you're all, um, that we're all making in behavioral health, so we're, we're delighted to have you here. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that I um, want to thank Governor Baker for coming, Secretary Sutters, um, the CBHC Steering Committee that's all here, um, Governor, uh, Commissioner Doyle, uh, is in the back, and the um, CBHC steering committees, Tom Ambrosino, I think, with the mayor yeah, of, of Chelsea, uh, hey, is also here. Congratulations on your promotion. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to thank, uh, thank uh, you all for coming. Um, and I also wanted to thank our team here at North Suffolk. Uh, they have done just a, a wonderful job under the leadership of uh, Julie, Judy Lemoyne, which is our senior vice president of Clinical Operations and Systems Integration, and Audrey Claremont, which is the Assistant Vice President for Clinical Services. Um, they've, the, the whole team has done just a, a wonderful job at repurposing this historic building for the use of Community Behavioral Health uh, Center. Um, so thanks to the team. Uh, wonderful job uh, to, the, to the team. So just a, a few words on you know, how, how we got here. Um, you all have heard the alarming rates of suicide. You all have heard the alarming rates of uh, overdose, uh, high arrest and incarceration of people with serious mental illness, homelessness, um, coupled with a workforce shortage uh, that for decades has been a point in need of policy change, legislative action, and um, clinically informed approaches. And so in that context, uh, I want to thank Governor Baker and his administration, including Secretary Sutters, the legislature, and many of you here today for recognizing the, the need to look beyond inpatient hospital beds as the one solution for those seeking um, behavioral health uh, treatment and psychiatric care. We have much to be grateful for to improve access to behavioral health care for people of all ages and disabilities in the Commonwealth. And, and I say that as a uh, public, not only as the president and CEO here at North Suffolk, but I say that as a public health professional and a person that has worked in five states. And God willing, this is the last state I work in. Um, but um, prior to coming here to the Commonwealth, I worked in, in the southeast in, in two states where they were ranked 37th in the nation for access to mental health and further south. 48th in the nation for access to mental health. I'm really proud to say that here in the Commonwealth, according to uh, Mental Health America, which tracks all this, it's second in the nation for access to mental health. And I know that that hasn't happened just magically. I know that it's been uh, Governor Baker's uh, leadership that uh, we've gotten there. Vermont. Vermont. This is like moving to Hawaii. <laughs> well, I, 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 COVID I, pandemic I, response. I think we can chalk it up because they have less people. Let's 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 put it in, into that context. Let's. Uh, uh, yes. So thank you, Governor Baker, for the passage of the landmark mental health omnibus law, the economic development bill, and Chapter 257 rate relief, and a fiscal year 23 state budget 
that prioritizes behavioral health, and what we're here to celebrate today, which is the implementation of um, critically health reforms focused on expanding, expanding access to behavioral health that includes community service boards or CBHCs. North Suffolk CBHC will be centered on immediate access to crisis while moving individuals, um, uh, including those with serious mental illness, substance use disorders, and intellectual and developmental disabilities from crisis response to ongoing and interconnected care. Uh, the CBHC model, uh, as you all may know, includes comprehensive services such as a crisis hotline 24-7, crisis evaluations both on site and uh, mobile, a statewide call center, behavioral health evaluations, uh, therapy, medically assisted treatment, psychiatry, recovery coaching, and peer supports. But equally important, it also provides a fiscal infrastructure um, that um, for behavioral health systems like North Suffolk to yield a behavioral health response that is local, accessible, uh, interconnected, and effective. Um, so um, North Suffolk will provide, uh, uh, will, or North Suffolk CBHC will provide an opportunity to sustain and build out a robust and tightly linked community-based service system to ensure a continuum of psychiatric care. And so history will look upon this opportunity as a remarkable time, and we are looking forward to shaping that history together. Uh, so again, thank you, Governor uh, Baker, Secretary Sutters, and the legislature for promoting access, health equity, and parity. Um, and we at North Suffolk look forward to partnering uh, as well with Governor-elect Healy and her administration, as well as all of you in the years to come, uh, for the sake of our clients and, and our communities. Um, and so, um, thank you. Thank you all. So, um, Governor Baker needs no introduction, but no, just, a, just, a, just, no, not, no? no. okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, Governor Baker. <laughs> um, so, um, first of all, I want to thank North Suffolk for hosting us today, and I want to thank you for all the work you've done for many years and for being a player in this community-based initiative. I also want to thank many of the folks who are here who are working in this community. Um, it has been an enormously challenging time for the last few years. And I also want to thank our colleagues from the legislature who I see here as well. Um, none of this gets done without your help and support. This has been an issue that our administration, again, working with our colleagues in the provider community and our colleagues in the legislature, have put a tremendous amount of work and effort into over the course of the past eight years. And I won't get into all of the details, but, you know, we've probably, we've increased our spending on substance use disorder among those residential programs that are separate and apart from the money we've put in through Mass Health by five times since we took office. Um, We've dramatically expanded the number of inpatient beds we do have available for mental health services up to the, I think it's probably close to 3,000 at this point. Um, we've also done a lot of work to dramatically expand community-based services, hundreds of millions of dollars in every budget, which the legislature incremental um, um, advances in every budget with the legislature has supported every inch of the way and several years ago. We began discussions about creating a behavioral health roadmap, which involved a whole series of steps to continue to build out community-based programming and to make it easier for people to access emergency mental health services, especially in a moment of crisis. And that process, which I'm sure Secretary Sutters will talk about a bit, um, has continued to unfold throughout the course of the pandemic. Um, we also, even though we invented telehealth, here in Massachusetts, it was never actually affirmed in state law. We were the last state in the country, I think, to affirm it in state law. Um, we chose during the pandemic, because of all the issues associated with physical contact, to put an executive order out around telehealth. And um, not surprisingly, at least to many of us, uh, people responded in a very big way. And that was especially true for folks who were seeking mental health services during that high anxiety time, and um, and I think you know if the typical um, if the typical missed visit rate was somewhere in the twenty percent range uh, for physical visits before we put out that emergency order, the um, the typical uh, missed visit range for telehealth services and behavioral health is about two percent. 
So there was a profound improvement in, believe it or not, access to services as a result of that telehealth um, executive order. And again, I want to thank the legislature um, for taking that executive order and helping us turn it into a statute so that we now have this as a covered benefit on a permanent, ongoing basis here in the Commonwealth. But the final thing I just want to speak to is the, the incredible work that was done by so many folks in the mental health space and the substance use space during the pandemic. I mean, if there's one thing that really matters in many cases when you're providing those kinds of services and supports, it's some degree of continued ongoing physical connection. And, um, and people did a lot of really creative things to not lose touch with many of their patients um, and the people they were serving during that period of time. And I, I think as a result, um, while every state suffered and the people of every state suffered, um, when it came to these kinds of services, Massachusetts suffered less. And I think that had a lot to do with why when Commonwealth Fund did a very comprehensive study of how states handled the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we finished this far behind Hawaii um, in second place, and Hawaii and Massachusetts were far ahead of the other 48 states. And I couldn't help but remember or think about the fact that Hawaii is an island, um, that does give them a little bit of an advantage that we sure didn't have. It's also warm most of the time there. Um, but they weren't grading on a curve, so we didn't get the benefit of that. Um, but I do, th I do want to say that the, the work of this community um, generally over the course of the past eight years, um, with a lot of support from us and from the legislature, um, has really been remarkable. People have done great things to dramatically expand the way we serve this community. And, and I do regret we weren't able to get the big enchilada that we filed twice, once in 2018 and again in 2020 over the goal line, which would have put about a billion dollars of additional funding into um, behavioral health services and addiction services. Um, but we got a lot done, and that legislation uh, that we signed at the end of the session will make an enormous difference going forward for people here in the Commonwealth, along with many of these initiatives and this behavioral health roadmap. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the architect of the Behavioral Health Roadmap um, and my colleague here in the Commonwealth, Secretary Mary Lou Sutters. Thank you. Actually, I was just the conductor because the roadmap is actually um, the culmination of an extraordinary amount of planning, listening sessions across the Commonwealth, taking in input to really design a roadmap that met the needs of the residents of the Commonwealth. Um, like the governor, um, I want to—I just want to give a uh, shout out to Senator Edwards, uh, Chair Madero, um, who is the chair of the Joint Committee of Mental Health, Substance Use, and a Recovery. I'm close. Uh, and uh, Tom Ambrosino, who's the city manager of Chelsea. Uh, having legislative champions and, and city managers and uh, municipal leaders in addition to um, all of our friends in the behavioral health and healthcare space and family members is really what makes today a reality. Um, thank you, Damien. Um, first of all, this is an extraordinarily beautiful building, a respectful building that signals hope and wellness and caring uh, and, and the fact that you would lean in in your community to really provide accessible, culturally relevant treatment and care speaks volumes about North Suffolk. Um, it's been a privilege to work in an administration and for a governor who defines health care as fully inclusive of behavioral and physical health. When we say health, we mean whole health, physical and behavioral, from substance use disorder to co-occurring illnesses and mental illness. Since day one, the governor and the lieutenant governor have made behavioral health a priority, working very closely with our legislative colleagues. We recognize that until we address the pervasive stigma surrounding mental health and substance use disorder, that real change actually was impossible. It would be difficult. And that individuals and loved ones would continue to struggle. Mental health is not a fringe health care issue. A person cannot be healthy if they're not also emotionally healthy. As a family member with three generations of family having serious mental illness, I have navigated insurance, a myriad of wrong doors, paying out of pocket on occasion out of frustration and doing everything possible actually to keep one of my family members in, who lives in another state safe and out of emergency room, out of fear that they would be arrested 
rather than treat it. So I understand what families across the Commonwealth experience viscerally because my family and I have lived it. Even before COVID, although we had some strong components of a behavioral health care system in the Commonwealth, as my staff know, I often talk that we have the component parts but not the system, and we've made great progress together. It still has been far too complicated for people to find the right care, the right pathway at the right time, ending up in emergency departments when nothing else was available. And then, of course, came the pandemic. The pandemic has only exacerbated the behavioral health challenges that so many people face. Isolation, anxiety, depression, children and youth experiencing dysregulation. We're fortunate that in Massachusetts, our elected officials, the governor, the lieutenant governor, the incoming administration, and our legislative champions are committed to true behavioral health reform, true parity. Over the summer, the governor, Senate president, and speaker came together to celebrate the enactment of the most important behavioral health legislation in the past 10 years, with true parity at its core. Pre-pandemic, we started out on the path of creating a front door to behavioral health, to the ambulatory system, so that individuals would be able to find that pathway, that doorway to treatment. This reimagined clinical front door, as you heard from Damien, builds up the community crisis capacity, providing a 24-7 clinically and culturally appropriate staffed helpline and expanding the ability to immediately triage an individual for an assessment and initial treatment. We have designated 25 community behavioral health centers across the Commonwealth, such as this one at North Suffolk. Congratulations. With the new mental health law and the roadmap for behavioral health rolling out, it changes the landscape of ambulatory behavioral health care in Massachusetts. I have hope that true parity is finally within reach on the horizon from that very first piece of legislation that was signed in 1998. No one should face barriers when attempting to access mental health support or substance use treatment. Emergency departments should be a last resort, not the only resort. When individuals walk through the door, physically or virtually, at North Suffolk Community Behavioral Health Center, they will have access to comprehensive coordinated treatment. One clinical place where people can access same-day evaluation and referral to treatment, evening and weekend hours, timely follow-up appointments, and evidence-based care. CBHCs offer a refuge for individuals in crisis, a much-needed alternative to our hospital emergency departments. We'll be closely linked with Behavioral Health Helpline, which also launches in early January, so all of this launches in early January. The effects of this pandemic on our community will be with us for years to come and warrants our strong recommitment to comprehensive behavioral health care. We must lean in, embrace, and support individuals and their families struggling and not let stigma hold us back. I want to thank you, North Suffolk, for your longstanding commitment to your community and to behavioral health care. And I want to thank, I want to, you know, I just, I want to thank my team. Um, I stand on their shoulders each and every day. Um, I see, Commissioner, I can't see anybody behind the cameras, but, but I have a strong team here from Mass Health, the Department of Mental Health, and the Department of Public Health. And it's really that. We know who you are. We know who you are. And it's that extraordinary group of people who work very closely with our community partners who really make all of this possible. And it's now my pleasure and privilege to hand this over to Audrey Claremont. Uh, hello. Today I have the honor of introducing Brett Fiore, whose recovery journey started at North Suffolk in 2014. Brett has made a lasting impression on many here today. Um, I remember, I first remember Brett when I was in this very building working as a clinician, fresh out of school. Um, I wrote a letter advocating for Brett for a court case that he had coming up. And I recall, I do those a lot, um, but I recall this letter specifically because I was so new and I was really selling this guy. And uh, so I had my fair share of thought spirals, hoping that he stayed on the right path uh, because otherwise I may have set a record for the fastest license revocation in Massachusetts history, um, which I'd only gotten like 30 days before that at that point. Um, and look at you now, Brett. Clearly, I had nothing to worry about. 
You have not only helped yourself, but so many others along the way. Uh, a person in long-term recovery, the owner of Boss Junk, uh, the company, or sorry, the person in long-term recovery, an owner of Boss Junk, which was the company North Suffolk hired to help get this CBHC site ready. Um, and in Brett's own words, he is the man we all can thank for getting Meridian House brand new floors in 2015. And for those... <laughs> yeah. And if you haven't heard that story, I encourage you to approach Brett. Um, it's, it's a good one. That's not important. <laughs> <laughs> so, please join me in welcoming today uh, the most important person in the room, as he is a living example of why we are all here, Brett Fiore. <laughs> I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to share that story. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know where I was at my life in that time uh, with my finances. I felt the need that the uh, facility needed a renovation, so I may have flooded the house by accident. <laughs> so they got that renovation. But uh, Kim can tell you more about that. Uh, a little over eight years ago, I walked into Meridian House, a North Suffolk run treatment center. I was in my mid-20s, and like much of my life prior to this, I was full of fear, anxiety, worry, disconnection, and most of all, hopelessness. I had been wrapped up in my dark disease for so long that I'd actually become content with the fact that I would just have to go on living this nightmare day to day. I needed a miracle. I had a four-year-old daughter, light of my life, who for the last two years, her developing years, I would later learn, I had been absent for. I had two brothers who were then and are now the best men I know. They were building and leading beautiful lives, seizing opportunities, establishing themselves in the world, and most importantly, for good reason, staying away from me. I had a mother who was an absolute angel, I definitely will admit I'm a mama's boy. She would bear this disease with me day in and day out, 24-7, all while making sure I knew she was my biggest fan and that I was loved and could get better no matter how lost I was. She always kept her faith strong and her hopes high, even though I had become a liability to be around and unpredictable. I was reaching a point where my addiction and mental health had completely taken over and I had gotten myself into what I now call my last jackpot. Again, I needed a miracle. November 14, 2014, I walked into that treatment center. You can get that. And it was right there on that first it was right there on that first night, just a few blocks from here, where I would receive a gift like no other. Something I haven't felt in a long time and thought it was lost. Hope. There was a fellow client celebrating a milestone at a meeting that night. Her sh and she was sharing about where she had been, where I and so many of us had been. Hopeless. Ironically, this client had her mother and two sisters there supporting her that night. I couldn't help but notice their faces weren't filled with fear and worry and disgust. Instead, it was happiness and relief and pride. I remember it like it was this morning. I put my face in my hands and I thought what I would give to have that from my mother and brothers. This would be one of the very first conversations I would have with my recovery coach. Her response were words that would echo in my soul. You can have that. You are a miracle. You are a miracle. This type of support, guidance, trust, and most of all, hope, is what I would receive over the next 18 months living inpatient under North Suffolk's roof. My recovery coaches, therapists, relief staff members, and everyone else who was a part of the team made sure I knew every day I could get better. I could have some freedom from my disease. I didn't have to wake up every day and walk around hopeless. And most of all, I did not have to be defined by this disease anymore. I was a miracle. North Suffolk stood by my side over that year and a half while I would utilize resources from this special commonwealth to enroll in parenting classes to see my daughter again, public transportation passes to get to and from various places. I needed and I was putting my life back together one piece at a time. I was able to get my license back, gain computer access to locate certain documents for my legal and probate obligations, and so much more. It seemed like every time a new problem would arise, there was always someone on the team to help, especially the uh, great flood, wherever you are, Kim. <laughs> uh, well, the renovations, I say. While I was building and taking opportunities one day at a time, my family was also in their own healing process. My mother joined a group right here in this building on Monday nights where she would come faithfully every week. She would learn to cope alongside other parents, siblings, friends, and family members who had also been affected in some way by this dark disease. I had turned a lot of my hurt, guilt, and shame into motivation and hope and experience. I wanted my daughters and brother and mother to support and be proud of me. More important than this, I wanted to love and be proud of myself. By the time I had moved on from Meridian House, I had a full-time job, another part-time on the weekend, I had a vehicle I had just paid my first month's rent at a sober house, 
and I was consistently taking care of my financial obligations, something I could never do before in my life. My life was changed, when with a lot of help from my recovery coaches, I was able to set up parenting time with my, at that time, five-and-a-half-year-old daughter, all while still being told, you are a miracle and you can do this. I am no longer the liability around my family or the addict who is unreliable and unpredictable. I'm a brother, son, friend, father, business owner, and sponsor. I was the best man at my brother's wedding, godfather to my niece, and hopefully after today, expert ribbon-cutting ceremonial speaker. <laughs> I'm, learning, I'm learning to love myself. I'm learning to love myself and be okay with the miracle I am. I have found someone who loves me back, whom I can share this beautiful life with. We have two amazing children whom we provide daily for, be it dance class, gymnastics, Sunday school, Disney World, or just sitting in the playroom. I'm there today. I am present. We have been able to reach so many goals that used to be unattainable, and we still have so many more to go. A few years ago, I made another dream come true. When with my family, I started a company called Boss Junk, where we specialize in all removal and hauling needs, especially for the governor's office. I could not have been, I could not have been more honored when we signed... <laughs> it's not that easy. I could not have been more honored when we signed one of our first clients, North Suffolk. Imagine that, the very place that saw me at rock bottom now utilizes my business for our services. The feeling I receive when I enter some of these facilities, including this one today, to provide our services to the very place that offered me the tools that saved my life cannot be put into words. For the past eight years, I call the same five people who were there for me since day one to tell them I celebrate another year clean, thanking them for always being there for me. And in particular, Katie, who was always there for me from day one, and she always says to me, there's no reason to thank me. We gave you the resources and tools, but you did all the work. The one who told me those life-altering words, you are a miracle. I offer simply a humble, thank you, Katie. I know what this organization has done for me and countless others. With this expansion and greater resources for those in need, I truly hope we can reach more suffering souls out there. So many times people just need to know there's a place to go, no matter what time the clock says. Because when your disease creeps in your head at 2 o'clock in the morning and you're all alone, that's when we need it most. That's when we need to know that there's someone there who cares, someone who will listen, someone who will tell us you can do this and provide the correct services to place them where they can receive the appropriate help. Someone who tells us you are a miracle. Thank you again, Audrey, for the introduction. Damien, Secretary Sutters, Governor Baker. It's an honor to be here today. Thank you for asking me to share. I appreciate all of you so much. My name is Brett Fiore, and I am a miracle. Also here to celebrate um, a name change for North Suffolk Mental Health Association. We are transitioning to North Suffolk Community Services. We were um, so excited to receive the, the Community Behavioral Health designation that we decided it was time to sort of expand um, and, and change our name. So yeah, so um, thank you all for that. Um, I had just a little memento for the Governor and Secretary. I wanted to give uh, some plaques. Um, to you, um, and it both read, uh, North Suffolk Community Services recognizes your outstanding public service to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts through leadership, service, and humanitarianism. We were intentional about putting humanitarianism because I think we get lost in the numbers, but there are people behind those numbers. There are families behind those numbers. And unlike what we hear sometimes on the, on the news with our friends on the news, there are many success stories out there, and so we wanted. We, we thank Brett for sharing his story because we do have to continue to reduce stigma uh, and continue to advance our field. But thank you, Governor Baker, for coming. Thank you. Um, thank you. And thank you, Secretary Sutters, for your leadership um, as well. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. So, if you will um, all join me for uh, for ribbon cutting outside, and then there'll be tours, and please. Help yourself to food, which we have in the back, because we do not want uh, to carry away any food. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. This is wonderful. <laughs>